Howdy seekers, today I'm going to talk about meditation. Now meditation has an abundance of uh, definitions, right? But if you look in the uh, dictionary and you look up the definition of meditation, it's it, I, some of the some of the definitions is reflections, thinking, um, you know, focusing on an object of some kind, thinking through that kind of thing. Now this of, often gets mis mistaked with sati or sama sama samadhi, which is right concentration. Now concentration is a little bit different from reflection sometimes, and sometimes it's the same thing. It's kind of confusing because you've got this. Um, the two kind of branches, the famous branches, which is either samatha or samatha or vipassana, right? But one of the other things that, uh, uh, one of the factors that are really important um, is sati, which is awareness. Now, we've talk I've talked about this at length in various videos, but I, I think some of these things need to be repeated and some of these things need to be revised over and over again if you're trying to practice and get it right, because one thing I find when you try to sit down to meditate for long periods of time, um, it's good to start with sati first as reference to uh, to kind of take refuge in the or to uh, I guess create uh, create like a frame of reference for yourself before <clears throat> you try to start to um, either do samatha or vipassana or both at the same time, right? And um, I've talked about that briefly, but you know we'll get we'll, I'll I'll touch on it and go deeper and deeper from here and there. And uh, you just have to, uh, unfortunately, this is not a plug. I'm not an advertiser or a marketing agent or trying to uh, do anything but <clears throat> say what the what the truth and the facts are. Like you just have to watch uh, my previous videos because I can I kind of have a thread throughout and I talk I touch on all different subjects in my. Uh, videos. The thing is, when when you upload a video on YouTube, you've got to put a title and a cover, and you're very limited. <clears throat> For example, I could in the cover or or a, or a title. You know, you can't write a like a, a synopsis of five paragraphs of what you included in the video. I guess you could put it in the description, but you know, most people aren't going to click through, then read the description, then watch the video. So most people. Uh, we'll look at the cover or the title of the uh, video and then think, okay, uh, I'm interested and then just click it on. Now, I'm sorry about the resolution of the camera. I've got a just a cheap camera and I'm in a new place and it's a lot of light and the walls are white. So it, it kind of, the camera doesn't like it so much. This camera doesn't like it so much. Um, and I saw it in the other, in, in the previous video I uploaded, it's a bit pasted and a bit grainy. So Unfortunately, I can't do much about it. Um, I might try to find a different place um, to shoot a video next time or, you know, to record a video. So, uh, you know, apologies for the uh, lack of present, you know, lack of presentation. But then again, you come here for Dharma, not for presentation, not for entertainment, I suppose, right? So, frame of reference and meditation. Now, there's meditation, there's concentration, there's thinking, there's thinking, there's feeling, right? There's mental pain or mental pleasure, right? There's thoughts, and then there's the wisdom faculty, right? There's the silent faculty, there's the knowing faculty, there's the knowing that you're going to know faculty. Um, and so like if you were to read the Vipassana Bhumi, uh, for example, the, the Vipassana Bhumi, um, discourse for example <clears throat> well not it's not so much a discourse it's a well, I guess it is in a way but we chant it regularly uh, vipassana bhumi right so that explains the various uh, like the six sense bases the uh, the 12 faculty the 24 faculties things like this right so basically we also need to be aware when we when we're sitting down to concentrate or walking meditation or standing or lying down there's a thing called contact. Now, I know some of you are veterans here, um, so you know what I'm talking about. But for the others, um, contact is, for example, my eyes, like I'm looking at this camera now. So although I'm in a room and there's other things, 
happening in this room. There are other features of these rooms, uh, other features in this room. For example, there's a wall and there's other things that you can't see on the camera. My focus, my eye, is making contact with the camera right now and kind of ignoring what's going on uh, in the background and everywhere else. And this creates information. So when I look at this camera, um, it creates, uh, the contact creates like what we call a consciousness. It creates a consciousness. It's the consciousness that comes from contact. So we call that eye consciousness contact, right? Eye consciousness contact or e consciousness contact. So in, in modern terms, or I guess scientific terms, you would call that information. So when we're trying to concentrate, we're actually trying not to make contact with the six sense basis to anything out there. Now, what's interesting, there's a thing called mano, and there's a thing called chitta. And this uh, needs to be discerned. Yeah, this is a this is a bit this took me quite a while to, to chew on it, and I went back and forth and I still haven't got it 100% figured out, but I'm, I'm, I think I'm starting to you know, understand some of it at least anyway, so I hope this helps you in some way. If you've got anything to add, that would be great. Again, you know, we're, we're traveling on this uh, together. Um, you know, I'm not trying to stand out as some kind of teacher sitting in a mountain or in a cave trying to, uh, you know, professing to know it all. You know, and it's not, not, my, it's not my gig. It's not my, it's not my calling. My, my calling is just to share. I don't, you know, I'm quite a relaxed kind of person in a lot of ways. And, um, and I like to share and I like to learn. I like to learn and I find doing some, sometimes doing these videos, I learn a lot, learn a lot um, myself about what I say and it puts me to the test. And so you'll find many times I like to contradict myself and then I think about it and, and, and it challenges me. It keeps me on my toes because you see, knowledge, wisdom is a continual growth. You know, it's, 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 you're continually growing. You're continually trying to break the barriers of, of your own ignorance or of, of your own limits. And uh, which is, you know, it, it's not really a physical thing. It's, it's, it's more of a knowledge thing. It's, it's more of a, a wisdom thing because we're trying to, uh, there's, there's a part of ourselves, right, um, called the wisdom faculty, right? And we're not taught about this a lot in schools. <clears throat> and the values in our society are usually revolved around good things like family, um, you know, hard work, you know, honesty, things like that. But the pursuit of wisdom, the pursuit of wisdom is not common, right? It's not common. So what, what in Buddhism, uh, we like to pursue wisdom because through wisdom, wisdom helps you to see things, helps you to understand things, helps you to know things as they are. So it gives you clarity, right? It gives you clarity. It gives you that, that clear, the, the clear chitta, as Long Time Mahabur uh, said many times in many, many of his Dharma talks, that the chitta is clear, right? A lot of people talk about light, right? But I guess clear could be a sort of light, but it's not like this shining, glowing thing, or it could be like a who knows, right? But... A lot of the sages of past have talked about the chitta being clear as well. You know, so it's really interesting, something to ponder on and something to uh, reflect on. So coming back down, back to mano, right? Mano and chitta. Now, chitta is mind and mano is mind too. So this is where the confusion starts, right? Particularly from a Western framework. So the chitta is, is the pure mind and the mano is the... Uh, I guess, I guess, right, is is kind of like the six <clears throat> is the thinking sense or the 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 sense that comes with the body. For example, the eyes come with the body, the nose comes with the body, taste comes with the body, hearing comes with the body, uh, tangible sensations. You know, when you're feeling things, uh, that comes with the body, right? And thinking comes with the body. It's like part of the machine. It's like the process of the CPU. Uh, if that's the right one, the CPU, or is it the, <clears throat> I guess the motherboard, right? The chip, okay, that comes with, it's the chip inside the human body. Whereas the chitta is something else. Now, now the Buddha has talked very deeply on this and says he doesn't call it a soul, a spirit, or, a, or, or you know, something like that. It's just chitta is chitta, 
that's it. It's not self. It's not self. So the so the wisdom faculty lies beyond the man or beyond the this kind of the chip the chip mind in our true nature mind, I guess. Right now, now this is something that you have to study. You have to study, right? And we also know in modern science, in Western science, um, that they've got there's a long way to go to understand brain function, for example, or what the mind can do, right? There's a long way to go. There's still there's a lot of undiscovered things, right? So the brain and the mind are two different things in, in, in practice. And you can experience this yourself real time, direct through direct experience, right? So these things have to be studied. There's a lot of things, like some people might think it's like a bit of a cop-out. It's like, you know, a little bit of a avoid the, the question and just say, well, go practice. You've got to find out for yourself. Well, <clears throat> sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. But sometimes it isn't. Because sometimes you just got to dive into the water to understand what wet feels like. You know, it's kind of like uh, I can sit here and explain to you that green curry is so delicious, right, from my perspective. And I can talk about it for five days, but until you taste green curry, you're not going to know. You know, you're just not going to know for yourself. And you might taste and think, oh, this isn't as, isn't as good as what he says, right? So, so, so you know, there, there is this aspect of practice. See, <clears throat> the Buddha stresses and talks about Bhavana, Bhavana, right? Cultivation and development, cultivation and development, right? Cultivation and development is not just about reading or just listening to people all the time. Now, listening is important, reading is important, studying is important, right? All those things are important, but then doing it yourself is also important too, right? It's like reading a, sometimes you need to read a manual. You want to be a mechanic, for example. Well, you've got to get some theory, I guess. I guess, right? Or you've got to watch someone, right? Or you can just go trial, trial and error as well, right? But even then, it's still a study. But eventually, you've got to, got to go hands-on at some point. You go hands-on at some point. And that's where you start to make the mistakes. You start to learn. <clears throat> you know, you start to sweat. Uh, you start to get tired. You get frustrated. Uh, you, you, you get pushed to the wall. Um, and that's how you learn and grow. There has to be periods of this where you're getting frustrated and, and just not knowing what's going on because that's, put, that's going to the wall. That's going to the edge all the time of what you know and what you don't know. So that's what cultivation is and development is. And that's what pushing the boundaries to get into the wisdom faculty is all about. It's constantly trying to abandon evil, abandon ignorance, abandon not knowing and realizing, realizing, knowing, right, for yourself. So this is a constant uh, looking at something, dropping it, you know, looking and dropping, looking and dropping, looking and dropping, letting go, letting go. Now I've talked about letting go in depth um, on, on, on a video I put up on Buddhist Cafe. So I, I've talked about <clears throat> Buddhist Cafe, so slowly, slowly, I'm going to be uploading my own videos there. If you uh, are a Buddhist and want to have a channel on Buddhist Cafe, you can. You can upload videos there now, so, uh, and you can create a group and things like this, so I encourage you to do that. But anyway, I digress, back on point. So mano and chitta. So this is what I'm talking about when, when I'm talking about parameters. Now, meditation, right? There's many teachers out there, there's many teachings, there's a lot of books uh, by a lot of monks, by a lot of practitioners, lay people, there's, there's the suttas, there's the discourses itself, there's the Tipitaka itself, Buddhist teachings, and then there's where you sit down and you start to practice on your own and you let go of all the, the theory and you start to engage in your own practice, where you start to go it alone. At some point right this is this is where things get difficult because most people that I see 
that come to the temple and want to do meditation and stuff um, and they want to learn when you when you ask them well just go and sit under that tree or go and sit in that go and sit in that hut and just sit for three hours and don't move right and just focus on your breath most people can't do it you know most people can't do it why why because there's, there, there, there has to be some kind of method at some point and there needs to be a discipline. There's a lot of things that have to come together before you can actually enter samadhi or jhana, um, uh, like as the Buddha says in the text. Now, jhana is a pretty advanced state. Like you, you have to think, for example, the first jhana, right? You're talking about concentrated thought, right? Your thought is concentrated with your object and it's very still. What basically that means is your mind's not distracted. Your mind, the, the chitta is, is, is engaged. It's not trying to go out through the six senses to extra, extrapolate information. It's trying to not make contact. It's, it's not interested in making contact with what's going on everywhere. Not even in your own body. Not even in your own body in terms of mental feeling right, or, or thoughts. It's gone beyond this into more of a silent state heading towards the wisdom faculty, pure wisdom, right, heading into your pure, into your pure nature, right. <clears throat> so these things, right, they're not kind of easy to do. Now, easy to do. Now, I understand people wanting to do workshops and doing the boot camps and doing the 10 day workshops and then this and that. And I guess that's better than nothing, right? And, and, and things like this, but daily practice, daily practice is the, is the key, is the secret, is the, is, is the uh, um, you know, the one that opens the door, right? It's the daily practice. It's like, it's like a muscle. Right, so all these things, when we're, when we're sitting down to concentrate, to develop ourselves, we have to understand a lot of things about our human nature. So we also have to understand what the five aggregates are, the, what the body is. Right? So we, there's a study of that. There's a study of feelings. There's a study of perceptions. There's a study of memories. There's a study of fabrications, which is a bit elusive. And there's the study of consciousness itself, because in Buddhism, consciousness is part of the body framework, it's part of life, right? It's, it's not a consciousness or energy as spoke about in, in the new wave movements, in the, in the alternative uh, sphere or uh, in science either. Consciousness is just a five aggregate. It's actually nothing, it's nothing more. It's just something that the body needs and consciousness needs the body as a human being. But consciousness can exist on its own in a high place and it's there too. But what we're actually trying to do is go beyond this. Now you've got to think about that for a moment, just how, how um, advanced, the, I, I, look, advanced is probably the wrong term, of, you know, struggling to find the right term. I guess complex might be, might be a more accurate term, complex or, um, or astonishing or mind-blowing or overwhelming sometimes. So when we're sitting down to concentrate, okay, when you, when you try to go out on your own, okay, um, and you, you say, okay, I'm going to go in the backyard, I'm going to go to this place, I'm going to go to that place, and I'm just going to, I'm talking about starting on your own, I'm not talking about going to a temple or anything like that, or at, you're at a temple and there happens to be, um, you know, it's very quiet and it's a great place to concentrate, or you're on a farm or something, things like this. Eventually, you got to, when you try to sit down or you do your meditation walking, right? There's you got you got to focus on something, right? So usually, the first two meditations, the first meditation the Buddha taught was the was the sati kaya gata sati kaya gati sati, right? Or kaya sati yeah kaya gati sati or kaya sati, one of those things, right? Depending on how you read read or what what. All books are different. So body awareness, body awareness concentration. And he talks, and the Buddha taught about the 32 body parts, right? Now there's a story that goes with that, and I'll, I'll leave it till some other time. And, and then the Buddha kind of uh, left that for a while, and then he started teaching anapana sati, in, out breathing, 
sati, awareness. So awareness of the in and out breathing, right? And this is meditation. Now, I would argue that anapanasati is both samatha and vipassana. Both. Right? I would argue that. Because it is focusing um, in a samatha way, but it's also analyzing as well. Right? So that's a, that's a deep study in itself. Very deep study. But the point is, the idea, uh, the way the Buddha taught the, that meditation, is you're creating a framework. For example, the, there's, there's five stages in Anapanasati that need to be you need to be aware of. Okay, it's the breath body, the body, the feelings, the mind, the chitta, and dhammas, phenomena. Then, on top of that, we need to be aware of dispassion. What does that mean, right? Dispassion, abandonment. What does that mean? And cessation. And what does that mean? Right, so we're actually reflecting on all these qualities, on all these things, and we're cultivating and developing that knowledge while we're sitting down and concentrating. So it's not you just sit down to feel relaxed. It's not you're just sitting down to you know float away in your consciousness, float away between thoughts, and and your mind becomes just like a uh, I guess a ping pong or or a pinball where it just bounces off a like thoughts to thoughts to thoughts to thoughts to thoughts. See, that's not meditation. That's not concentration. That's just normal, what we call six base, six base or mundane existence or mundane concentration, like just working and you're just working and you're focusing on the task. That's not what we call bhavana, what we call sama, 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 samadhi or sama, samasati, right? This is a different thing. This is where we're trying to engage into a, a very, you're trying to bring the mind into a very steady, concentrated state where it goes beyond feeling. It doesn't pay attention to um, painful feelings. It doesn't pay, pay attention to pleasurable feelings or neutral feelings. It doesn't get bored. Very steady, very poised, right? Now, this is the fourth jhana already. So it actually, where the, where the chitta mind actually all retreats back into itself completely. It just withdraws completely into itself. It becomes like laser-like almost. So it's still there. But remember, this body is a nicha dukkha manata. The body is a nicha dukkha manata. It's not self, right? We don't own it. We don't own the six senses. We don't own the thoughts. We don't own the perceptions. Important to understand. Okay, so when we're sitting down and we're concentrating or we're walking, we're constantly being vigilant of the parameters. We're, we're understanding the body and always understanding there's the body. We're always understanding there are feelings. We're always understanding there's a mind. We're always understanding that there's dharmas or phenomena. We're always keeping our, our focus, our concentration, and our knowing with that at all times and not deviating not deviating right we're not deviating from that so instead of trying to think what's out there we are actually trying to think what's in here and what's beyond in here what's beyond in here right so the book is inside yourself right so when when we're talking about sitting for long periods of time this takes this is like a marathon this is like a marathon, and I keep telling people this, um, you know, the boot camp marathon, you know, like these 10-day workshops. Now, I don't, again, I hope I don't come across condescending or patronizing or negative about this. Uh, maybe my tone is a little bit like that, but it's, it's not intended, right? The thing is, it's, it's kind of like you have to understand, like, I understand the layperson would say, well, I've got to work, I don't have time, so I've only got 10 days a year, so that's when I do my practice. Maybe that's true, maybe that's valid, maybe it's not, right? But then I use a different example. For example, if you want to run a marathon, um, do, you just, do you then say, okay, I won't train all year, but I'll just run the marathon when it comes around, when, it comes around, when that date comes around? It, to me, that it, I don't know how you can do that. And... <clears throat> If you do that, you risk damaging your body. Yeah. 
You risk damaging your body, injuring yourself, causing yourself all kinds of problems and pains, right? And long-term effects are probably not good from that. Same with focus and concentration. Same with focus and concentration. These are things that need to be understood. Like, you know, there, there, are, there are times where you shouldn't be meditating. When you're angry, when you're upset, um, when, when, uh, when you haven't eaten, for example, or you're very hungry, or you might be very ill, or, you know, maybe, uh, you know, I'm talking about intense emotional states. So it's probably not a good time to sit down and concentrate. Not in the beginning. <clears throat> but when the chitta becomes steady, those, those, states of, those states of mind don't exist in a person because the mind is, has a strong discipline. It's, it's kind of like if you're practicing running every day, every day, every day, you're running, you're running, you're running, you develop a certain uh, stamina, right? You, dis, you, diver, you develop certain agility, a versatility, a flexibility. You develop certain strengths that you otherwise would not have. Right? So when your when your mind becomes when your mind becomes steady and strong and poised, right, and is able to do many, many things, a lot of the peripheral things don't bother you so much. And this is what we call taking refuge in yourself, building a bridge to your own wisdom faculty in yourself, safety in within yourself. It's what we talk about in Buddhism. So when we're thinking about, I guess, the fundamentals, is that right? I guess where I'm, where I'm going with this is kind of like before you go and practice, right? We, we need to kind of have a game plan of some kind and understand what it is. So look, if you want to do boot camps, do boot camps, fine. You know, you'll learn something. You'll learn something. But if you want success, if you want to have that real discipline, if you want to engage and have success the only way is daily on any on any given skill on any given skill on any given profession on any anything that's worth doing requires sweat sacrifice and sometimes backbreaking <laughs> sometimes a lot of pain right and also sitting for long periods of time you will encounter periods of pain now just to, just to set the record straight in the tradition I follow, when we sit in meditation, we do not uncross the legs when it gets painful, right? You can kind of shift your back a little bit. You can, you know, move your head a little bit or something like that. You can do things like this, but you, but you cannot come out of posture. Now, to be able to withstand the pain at three or four hours or five hours or six hours, the mind needs to be very steady because when the mind is steady, pain's not felt and uh, I remember when I set out on a journey once uh, I guess when I was trying when I was a when I first started at all this uh, I, I, I seek the advice of a, a senior monk and in one sentence the, the, the monk said to me uh, the body doesn't feel pain the mind does and uh, at that point at that time in my life, this was a very significant statement. And, you know, it, had, it still got me chewing on that. I'm still chewing on that bone nowadays because the body just lies there. You look at a dead body, it lies there. It doesn't feel any pain. The body doesn't say, I'm dead, I'm alive, this and that. Right? You look at your hand or you look at the bones, they don't do anything. It's, it's everything else that says it's where the mind starts to say, well, it has a perception, it makes contact and then has a perception and everything else, and it starts to be critical. Now, the critical faculty, that's the part that gets us in the trouble, and the perception faculty is the one that gets us into trouble. I keep telling people this. This is where we suffer a lot, okay, uh, amongst, other, amongst other things, okay? But perception, for example, you can never get the 100% the right perception on any given topic or any given situation or any given historical event either, right? The right perception is a 360 degree perception on any particular topic. It takes a long time to get a 360 degree perception, a long time, right? Yeah. Think about it. Think about what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Try, to, try to use what I'm saying for your own benefit. You know, and uh, 
hopefully because like for example you might hear something you might even see something and you think well i saw it okay but did you see what happened before did you see did you see what happened after right so for example you might walk you might be walking down the street and see two people fighting and and you might walk and see one person attacking the other now it might be just that might be just that instance it just might be that one off thing sure but sometimes it's not sometimes there's a lot there's other things going on behind the scenes right because things aren't always what they seem and just cuz you see it as it is it doesn't mean it is that way sometimes right now and this is why wisdom helps us see things as they are and this is where the definitions start to become clearer because one thing they are is impermanent yeah all perceptions are impermanent they're not self they're not self and they're dukkha they're stressful because they're impermanent that you can't rely on them right and uh life teaches you that so life will teach you that sooner or later but if you've bent toward the buddhist goal if you if you start to listen to buddhist teachings by the way you know i'm hearing more and more like don't know why this is might be a little bit off topic i'll just say it for the sake of saying it uh there's a lot of people people have been saying that you know there's you know buddhism has taken from christianity in some way i don't think so i don't think so i even heard someone the other day saying oh uh buddhism came from freemasonry 300 years ago i mean buddhism was around 500 years before christianity it was well established in india and sri lanka sorry india at that time it was well established in india north india and and who else who who knows who where else right don't know why people say these things you know the buddha did say that people will quote his teachings and will not will use his teaching but not quote him will not say that they came from him right a lot of people do this now is it a big deal not really even if people are using it for their own i guess well like they're trying to earn money from it and stuff they use buddhist quotes they don't say it's from the buddha and they might make some, they might print it on the shirt or something well from a from a, i guess a good will and compassionate sense well at least the teaching is helping them earn a living in some way so i don't really have a problem with that but when you start saying that the buddha took from from christianity which was which came 500 years later i mean that's nonsense okay so i i don't know why i'm saying now just here sometimes when i hear things um you know i like to uh, uh kind of address them straight away that way i don't have to keep talking about it later like, I, i like to address things once like for example i address the meat ate the meat eating question i address that once i address the gossip i address that once some things i i address once and i put a video up and that's it if you if you want to think know what i think about certain things you can see certain videos with one topic and i've said it once and that's it so i don't have to revisit it all the time now obviously uh as a monk um my life is focused on bhavana and um doing these videos yeah you know, i you know what i really never intended to keep going up till now um and i don't think i don't know like my last video only had uh was was jumping from 140 views to 145 then dropping down to 135 i i don't know what youtube's doing with the algorithm or with the views or playing with stuff i don't know i mean these platforms are what they are but i started this channel i started this channel um during covid in order to reach out to friends and family um that i have in different countries while i was stuck in thailand haven't left actually um and it's i'm still doing it now because i'm i'm getting the subscribers are actually growing i i just didn't expect it so honestly um i only expected my subscriber count to get to reach 50 or so and not much more and i thought i'd just do videos through the covid and uh i would stop and for some reason i've not for some reason i know why i've continued because i've had feedback and people uh have urged me to keep going with it but you know i don't know like we'll see where this goes 
we'll see where this goes. You know, like, uh, um, you know, I created Buddhist Cafe. If you want to contact me there, you can private message me. You can join my group there. You can create your own channel on Buddhist Cafe. I've, I've created a project for us, for all of us Buddhists, where we've got somewhere to grow. There's no gatekeeping there, right? We, we've got our own server. Um, we manage it ourselves. And um, it's in line with Buddhism, and you can do whatever you want there in terms of Buddhism, if you're a monk even or a layperson, whatever. So that's why I created that. But I don't really want to spend my life on the internet or, uh, you know, these communication things these days, they've become quite pertinent in a lot of ways. I mean, uh, you know, truth be told, it's, a, it's how I keep in touch with my mother and other family members um, from time to time. But when I go into retreat, um, you know, we, there's no electricity in a lot of monasteries where I'm staying at. So, um, or, you know, there's very limited, which especially at this last place I was staying um, in the last six months. So I happen to, I was able to, you know, get out a video every now and again. Um, but here in the monastery, I'm staying during these rains. Um, it's, it's, it's like a little city monastery and it has, um, you know, all the conveniences um, necessary to run it but I'm not always in this situation now I did a video on my meditation teachers uh, uh, temple so it's called Wat Tamsahai Lompur Janrian so I might be visiting that um, temple I haven't been there for a while I might go back there and uh, just go all out again in terms of cutting away all this technology stuff and I won't be doing videos for a while so this is the problem like I know if you run a YouTube video channel or you run you do this kind of thing, people start to expect you to put videos up all the time. And if you don't, then they just abandon you and things like that, which I don't mind and I totally understand. I totally understand. But I hope you understand that I might abandon it from time to time as well. And uh, not to think that I've given up or anything, but uh, you know, it might be for periods of time, right? Um, but, you know, I, I don't want this to become like a career or like a something that becomes like a chore where I have to do it because I have to do it because I've got a channel, you know, to maintain it and stuff like that. I mean, I, you know, for me, I have to re, like I said, in my, in like in practice, I have to reevaluate the reason why I'm, I've got a YouTube channel in the first place. I've got to reevaluate that. I mean, I started, my, my initial focus was, to talk about the injustice of COVID. Now, whether you like it or not, I stand on the uh, not lockdown side, on not on the not that, you know, this one, not that side, right? And, and this is the other thing, this thing that I have to do, not say the words, right? This I don't like. I don't like this, right? So, you know, I, I would hate to get a, a lot of subscribers say the wrong words and then it all gets cancelled you know that's 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 what i see happening because eventually you know I, I talk it as it is right i i'm going to talk straight and as i see it and um there's a lot of things that are going on that i don't agree with and i'm not afraid to, to say so i'm not afraid right and i will say so but what's the point of building up a channel only to get cancelled when you know you're going to get cancelled if you say those things so for me, that's the reason why uh, I started Buddhist.cafe because I can say what I want there. That's it, right? But not everybody wants to join a website now because everybody's addicted to social media, YouTube, Instagram. You try to tell people to get off YouTube or try to get into a diff uh, an independent website. Hardly anyone wants to do that. I, I don't understand. Do you understand that these platforms, whilst they're good in a lot of ways, but they also take your data and they, and they also try to control the way you think. They have an agenda. Okay? So either you've got to make the change yourself and start to understand and make those shifts yourself or follow the way. Follow, follow, the, way of the, follow the way of the fool of the ignorant if you want to. But here I am with my community and the people that are special to me and are, and are supporting me. We're trying to create something that um, is... is has nothing to do with this with this stuff where we can speak freely we can uh, talk about any subject we want freely right in order to gain knowledge and wisdom about the subject 
right? And this is talking about anything, anything's on the table. Anything's on the table. Any kind of speech is on the table because that's what knowledge is. It's looking at it, even if it's horrible, you need to look at it, understand it, penetrate it. And if it's true, you take what's true. You always take what's true and you discard the rot or the, or, or the, or the ignorance. You discard it, you cut it off. As my father always used to say, when, you got it, when you're trying to build, the rot needs to be cut off the wood that you use, right? So you use what's useful and what's not useful, you discard it, right? So the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom, I mean, you, you look at the teaching of the Buddha, for example, one practice that often gets overlooked is the Buddha says, go to the Shanal grounds. Now the Shanal grounds, uh, if that's how you pronounce it, or Chanal, or Shanal, or Chanal, probably Chanal grounds, basically they're places where in India at that time, and still today, you can go to the Ganges and see, where they burn dead bodies. You know, and then they throw, and then they turf, sorry, <laughs> then they turf the body into the, into the Ganges River. The Buddha said, go and sit there for a few days. Have a look at the skeleton. Look at the breakdown to the point where even dogs are coming to grab the bones and eat the bones. Go and study that. Go and sit at a cemetery. Right? The Buddha tells us to do this. The Buddha tells us to do this, right? So in other words, you're looking at everything. You look, and like one of the things that this is not going to be pleasant. So, you know, maybe cover your ears for a minute or so or 30 seconds, right? But one thing that we learn is, is about your, your body. So like, for example, you might focus on um, the, like we look at the beauty of the body, but what about the filth of the body, the body odor? Don't have a shower for three or four days. And study it like sometimes when you're out like at this other monastery I was out I was uh, like I've been to others but just recently um, I was at a very uh, secluded spot where there's wild elephants and, 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 and monkeys and all kinds of stuff all kinds of animals insects and you name it it's there bar tigers that's in uh, the west of Thailand I was in the north right but you know, the water is not much, so you can't have a shower every day and sometimes the water is green because the tanks the tanks are old and, and the water comes through and it's all green and smells and it's all f like got fungi and stuff in it, right? Mold and mildew. So you've got to wait for the sun to kind of clean, cl you know, dry everything out and then you, you can have a shower or wash your clothes or wash your robes, right? And then sometimes in the toilet, Right, you 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 just got a hole. Now this is not pleasant, but this is the human body. The Buddha tells us to have a look. He even talks about eating and eating and crapping, eating and eating and going to the toilet, eating and going to munching and defecating, munching and defecating. The Buddha talks about all this stuff. You know, there's there's nothing. I mean, if you were to read, for example, the 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 code of discipline. There's a lot of not conservative things in there, okay? And, and there's a lot of things that the Buddha talks about and there's, you know, that were experienced. I mean, the Buddha talks about even, like, uh, when was it? Was it, was it uh, Venerable Badali? Help me, people. There was, there's a teaching where a lay person says, I'm going to put this bowl made of pure sandalwood up on a tree and... You know, if you if a monk can fly up and get this tree, because at those times there was a lot of monks with a lot of psychic powers that could do a lot of things, according to the text. And one monk did it. He got the bowl, and the Buddha said, "Mate, it's as if it's as if um, you know you gave a coin to a young girl to lift up her skirt. What you did, you know? See, so, see, so this is the thing. This is real. This is real. Like." We're trying to become wisdom does not come from hiding or from being meek or for being afraid of going in going into situation difficult situation. We know difficulty teaches. I've said this many times. Difficulty teaches. It's a teacher in itself, right? Sometimes you've got to sweat and you've got to work hard to learn the lesson. Sometimes this has to happen. 
right? So in Buddhism, we're not afraid of this stuff. You know, it's not being meek or just, oh, we can't talk about that. We can't talk about this. This is why I hate, you know, this is why I don't like these. Hate is a bit of a strong term. But I mean, I'm saying in a kind of like off, off the cuff sinus and not so deep. Like, But I just don't like platforms that will cancel you if you say something they don't like. Okay. Now, if you're saying stuff that's illegal, understandable. If you're saying stuff that pertains to um, causing harm to someone, Okay, but knowledge is not harmful. When you're trying to deliberate whether something is true or not, that's necessary. You know, lies destroy, are very destructive to society, everything, to everybody. Lies can destroy families. Lies can destroy countries. You know, lies are not good. Knowledge and wisdom builds things, right? It builds harmony. When you're clear about where you stand with someone, right, it creates harmony. It does. It really does create harmony, right? So sometimes, you know, we need to understand that in, when we're trying to uh, practice anything, right, it doesn't come easy to most of us, right? And then people say, well, how come there's some monks, even some novices in Buddha's day that became arahants immediately? Well, you could also say that about the Buddha. Why did the Buddha enlighten in six years? And some of us, there's been monks, you know, for generations, that were monks for 50, 60 years and weren't able to obtain, you know, attain. Well, there's a reason for that. Because we're talking about lifetimes. Now, contrary to Western thought and contrary to, to, you know, to the three main religions and all those kind of things, well, in Buddhism, we see the, con the consciousness links, right? There is consciousness links and there is um, rebirth and things like this, you know, the continuation, right? Of samsara, we do this take in, in we take this into consideration, right? So all these things, like when we're trying to practice, that's where you need to bring the the warrior, the peaceful, a word, warrior, two words, one statement, actually more than one statement. There's probably four statements in that in that statement, right? So you might be peaceful, but you're still a warrior. You're still a warrior. Now, in knowledge and wisdom, it's about lifting up the stones and taking a look. Imagine going to a charnel ground at night, during the day, you're seeing people bringing dead bodies, they get burnt, you see the, the, the head explode sometimes, when the, the, depending on when, on kind of like when they burn the body and things like this. So you see all kinds of things happening. Um, you know, when, when, when I've seen quite a few of these already. Um, you see all kinds of things um, happening when a body is burnt, you see the sadness, you see, and then you see what, and then you see the sometimes in India that the family cannot afford. This is what the body, and even in Tibet, sometimes the family cannot afford a burial, so they just abandon the body. Or there's people that just die, that don't have family or anything. They're just abandoned. They're just left by the wayside. You see what happens to the body. The Buddha tells us to take a look. Yeah, to take a look. Now, going back to my story about the body odor and stuff, you know, if you want to do an experiment, and I suggest this one day, if you ever get a chance to, if you're ever in a situation, you should, you should have a look at this for yourself, right? Put yourself in a situation where uh, just for a little while, just for a few days, maybe a week, and dig a hole and defecate in that hole. <laughs> I've had that experience quite a few times. And then you will see how much comes out of the body. You'll, you'll be surprised. You'll be shocked because in our modern convenience, we go to the toilet, we flush it, who cares? But this body exudes a lot of nasty stuff, right? But we don't want to look at that. It's not status quo. It's not politically correct. It's not nice. It's kind of goes against the grain. We must only talk about pleasurable things. See, you're never going to get to wisdom that way because that's, that's a polarity that you're, you're going into the beauty polarity, or you're going into the pleasure polarity of life. You're not looking at it. The, you're not going from extreme to extreme to middle, and between and between middle and between between middle and extreme. Between middle and you're going to you know between middle between middle and extreme. Middle between extreme. You're not going in those five directions in your analysis of life and things and phenomena. So how do you expect to grow? So this is why 
It's not something you can just do in a boot camp. It's not something you can just do in two days. Be realistic about that, you know. And again, I'm not saying don't do retreats. I'm not saying don't do that. But you have to understand, right, there's a lot of things to study. You know, when you look at, I'll finish on this today because I've been talking for quite some time. This was only meant to be a, a short video. If you've made it this far, congratulations. Um, you know, if you look at the Buddha and you look at the stories from the Buddha of his six years of practice where he sat until the body was completely emaciated. It was just basically skeleton, no food, you know, uh, he didn't move off his seat for I don't know how long it was. Um, I think it was six months or something. I'm not sure. Right under a tree. Okay. Can you do that? Can anyone do that? This is how dedicated the Buddha was to finding the, the answer. Right. And he went to that extreme. Then he came back. This is what I'm trying to tell you. Now, the Buddha obviously says it's not necessary to do this, right? You don't have to do that. I've done it. This is the way to go. But for some people, they have to go to the extremes. And this is evident, this is evident uh, particularly with Ajahn Man. Ajahn Man used to seek difficult places, caves where there was wild tigers in those days. You know, that's Ajahn Man's story. I've talked about him. It's my cover video. I've got to change that. I've left it up for quite some time. I've got to change it. But I think, you know, Ajahn Man, for example, used to go to difficult places where there was tigers and wild, and, and wild elephants. Now, if you've never been around an elephant at night on your own, let me tell you, it's I, I've had that experience. I can say I've had that experience clearly now quite a few times, but in these last six months, I had the experience quite a few times. Now, a bull elephant at night is so loud and the sounds they make are incredible. And they the power they have and they come crashing through the forest. You're just sitting there. It's quite a quite an experience, right? And Ajahn Man used to seek these places in order to in in order to force himself into concentration or force something out of himself because he was really dedicated. He really wanted to know, right? And sometimes we have to do that. And you look at Mahabua, where he used to walk meditation five, six hours a day at times and then sit for 10 hours. You try it. Right? But this is what the great ones have done, right? So I'm not saying um, anything negative about people who don't do it. But I think we need to be more realistic about what practice is and when you're trying to meditate, what you're actually getting into. It, it's a deep study, right? So I hope this clarifies things for you. And the positive thing about this is you can do it on your own. But what I'm saying to you, it's like this, right? Um, Mr. Universe, um, back in the day, I think it's still around, where you know you got Mr. Mr. Yeah, I think it's still around for sure. Or it might have been, they call it something else now. But it was like the strong, you know, the, the muscle man. And then you got strong man, right? Strong man. Now, they don't become strong men overnight. They started off as just like a, a kid or a teenager some t at some point. Probably scrawny, probably not strong at all. Right? And then they started to go, started to practice a little bit here, a little bit there. And then eventually started to get strict with it, develop discipline with it, and eventually start to commit to it. And then eventually it became a thing. And then eventually, right, after a period of time, they become massive and strong. Well, that's what Bhavan is all about. That's what cultivation and development means. And you cannot cheat this, people. You cannot cheat it. Right? cannot be cheated. There's no shortcuts. There's no shortcuts. Yet, look, all of you know what happens when you take shortcuts. Do you, need me to, do you need me to do a talk on taking shortcuts? I'm sure you understand what I'm talking about. You always regret shortcuts. Okay? Because at, when it comes later on in life, 
when you need that skill, you realize you cheated or you, you, you took a shortcut and it's not there, right? When you learn things, when you do things, it's good to do them properly all the way. No shortcuts. Square corners where necessary, right? Dot the I's, cross the T's, right? Being profound. The, the two dharmas is being thorough and consistent, right? The Buddha talks about being thorough and consistent in what you, that's in the Samyutta Nikaya. Right, I think, or, actually, or is that the Anguttara Nikaya? I'm not sure now. Yeah, I can't remember now. Um, I've got to get back into those Nikayas one day. I'm trying not to read uh, much because I study other things now. But um, like I'm studying uh, the monastic code um, uh, more and more these days. And I find it interesting uh, how the rules came to be and and, and, and looking at the deeper effect of why uh, the Buddha put in place these rules, I find them fascinating more than anything else, right? And I have, I have done for quite a few years. But thorough and consistent, you know, being thorough and consistent in everything you do, right? That in the future, that builds, you build a bedrock of, of, of virtue, skill, knowledge, you know, wealth of knowledge, actually, wealth of knowledge. And this always comes in handy. Whenever you take shortcuts, it never leads to anything good. I mean, sometimes you've got to take shortcuts. I understand. I understand life is not, you know, it's not black and white. There's gray areas. There's, there's all kinds of things going on in life, right? I understand that. But if you're trying to raise your standard, if you're trying to lift your game, if you're trying to become better, if you're trying to become stronger, at some point you've got to let go of the childish things. You've got to let go of the BS, right? And you've got to step in, right? Step into the big pants, right? Step into the big shoes and start walking that th walking that path for yourself at some point, right? I'm talking when you're ready for it, right? So practicing concentration to finish this video, I need to I need to stop talking. I've been talking for too long here. Um, when you're trying to practice concentration, remember the parameters first, right? And what I'm talking about, of course, is the satipatthana or the, the four parameters of sati, right, of awareness. Which is, well, there's four parameters, which is body, feeling, mind, dhammas, phenomena. So you're being aware of those at all times. And what you're trying to practice is not clinging to them. Because the mantra that is practiced at the same time that the Buddha encourages to, to say is, you abide, we abide not clinging to anything in the world, which is the five aggregates, which is everything connected to the body. And, the, and or the human that's sati that's developing sati. so that's where you start when you sit down you start there then you can travel off into anapanasati anapanasati or you can travel off into uh, just buddha or you're just one object or you can go into analyzing qualities you can do all kinds of things but you can't do that in 10 minutes right or maybe you can Maybe you can. Like, I'm saying that from an advanced point of view. When you've done all the study and then you sit for 10 minutes, you can do it. But in the beginning, it's, you have to learn to sit or walk, meditate, or learn how to be steady. Right? Learn how to be steady. Because Buddhism is the entire study of our own nature and knowing the truth within, knowing what wis where, wis where the wisdom lies and what our true nature is, what we really are, and what lies there beyond. So this is not something that's an ad hoc thing that um, is taught in a lot of, I guess, non-Buddha circles, right? Where it's just meditation is 15 minutes, you feel happy. Um, it, that's, look, you know, peace to you, like if that's what you want to do. But um, in terms of if you're coming kind of to the, to the uh, I guess, hardcore, where, where, or if you're just tired, tired of suffering, you're tired of, um, you're tired of roaming, you're tired of transmigration, you're tired and you want the answers and you want to go free, well, this requires the strongman technique, right? It requires the Mr. Universe technique. And for the ladies, you know, it requires for you to be the strongman technique, to use the strongman technique. <laughs> uh, I can joke, right? I can say a joke sometimes, right? But, you know, because I talk ma very masculine, but... But generally, you know, if you look at the text, the Buddha sometimes talks to the nuns, but generally he talks to the monks all the time. So I, I'm, I guess that's what I do. I, you know, it's, 
manly effort, manly, manly force, man, you know, getting things done is, 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 is a bit of man talk. But, I, you know, I don't want to – look, I have a lot of uh, female supporters um, and, you know, I respect them dearly. And, you know, I hope you understand my intention is when you're doing Dharma talks and you're trying to teach something, right, some, I've got to teach it accurately, right? Because what I'm ta talking about is something that requires strength, conviction, confidence, uh, tolerance, determination, you know, patience, perseverance. Pulling, following through, all these kind of things. Now, I said I was going to stop, didn't I? For some reason, I'm talking a lot today. Anyway, right? I, I hope you understand the difference, as I was talking about, between citta, mano, sati, anapanasati, right? Uh, study of body, learning all these, learning not to be afraid to engage in um, deep analysis of things that are negative to you. Right, you know, some sometimes um, I go on websites that show pictures of dead people. You know, it's kind of like sometimes the monks here will go to the morgue and look at dead bodies because we don't have charnel grounds like in India, right? But you got to do that legally, and it's just, you know there's a whole thing about it. But you know, sometimes there's a lot of monks um, in some temples. You, um, the the head teacher, the the abbot puts pictures of dead bodies and uh, accidents on the walls on purpose, and so you can see it all the time. See, people might find that macabre and like, oh, they shouldn't be doing that. But once you understand it, once you can see what your nature is, you know what's I'll you know what. There's one thing I'll tell you. Here in this monastery, usually after the body's been cremated. They get the remains, and we and they request the monks to do a certain chanting for the for the for the for the remains of the person, right? And you see what the remains are, and it's a very telling experience. You know, I I encourage you to do it. You know, I encourage you to do it. It tells you a lot, shows you a lot about what the body is, right? Freedom doesn't come from hiding and and from being fearful, and from being afraid to analyze things um, that are probably ugly or scary. I'm not talking about jump out of a plane if you're scared of heights. If you want to do that, that's fine. We're not talking about that kind of conquering fear. You know, not, This is a whole different thing. This is more about conquering yourself, understanding what you are. So the fear, the fear starts with your mind. Do you need to jump out of a plane? Maybe you do. But... The fear of ideas, the fear that something else might be. So, for example, a lot of people can become tunnel vision when it's all, especially religion. You can be afraid to look outside your borders because you, you know, I must, I must stay within my borders and must not go out my borders. How do you know you might not learn something? I guess the saying, the grass is always greener on the other side. No, I'm not talking about that. This is a different concept. Knowledge and wisdom goes beyond borders. That's what you don't. That's what people need to understand. Wisdom is is a everything thing, right? It's an everything thing. It's an it's wisdom encompasses everything. It has no limits, in that sense. It's it's got no borders. So if you border your perceptions, if you border your thought processes, what are you doing? You're limiting yourself. Even as a monk, so what? This is a monk. Say, for example, I realize the monk is, is irrelevant. If you, if you look at the suttas, the monk life has been lived, done what was had to be done. I'm not saying, I'm not making that claim. I'm just saying at the end of the sutta, a lot of monks who realize they're no longer a monk. It, it doesn't apply anymore. This is just a, 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 a sankara, right? But this is the thing. If you have border thinking, now, of course, borders are necessary morality and they have a place. It's like the garbage in your house has a place. The toilet has a place. The, be the bedroom has a place. The bed has a place, right? Everything has a place. Doesn't mean one is more important than the other, okay? So borders is where you just, you refuse to go outside that border. Now, morality, sometimes you've got to do that. You refrain from evil. But you know the evil. That's the difference. How can you refrain from something you, you don't know? 
Now, when I say to people, don't watch pornography, you know, don't engage in evil, you know, don't abuse children or the elderly, right? Things like this. You know that abusing children and elderly is wrong. It's not good. You know that. You know that there's the contrast. So in, in a lot of religions, in a lot of philosophies, particularly these days with uh, the whole polarization of thoughts and, and sexuality and all these kind of things, people get stuck on borders and they will not, they will refuse to venture out for fear of, you know, being on the other side because of the hatred within. Do you want to be that person? Do you want to be that person? Wisdom does not do that. That's, that's not wisdom, okay? That's ignorance. That's engaging in hate and fear and, and wallowing in your own uh, self-conceit and pride. Like, I, mm, I, this, only this is true. Nothing else is true. Didn't the Buddha, Buddha warn us about that? Didn't the Buddha, the Buddha warn us about saying this is true and nothing else is true? 